I'm invincible. I'm paying money. Uh, the girl's happy. She's got no money. I got my rocks off. Oh, how good is this? Scene. I'm Jordan. I'm Joe. I'm Matt Marsden. And I'm Ashley Craven. And I'm with a new one. Peter Williams. No pressure. How good was the game last night? Oh, depends who you support. Joe, the North Melbourne supporter. Well, it was just a good, average win. That's and all. Just, <laughs> just coasting at the moment. Second Ke gear. Keeping the lit. Preparing for final. The lead is firmly on. Yeah, don't, don't want to expose it yet, but I think we might be winning a premiership. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's a you one impersonating there. But no, really, how do we um, how do we look at that sort of game? I mean, it was like North Melbourne couldn't do anything wrong. Carlton could do it, couldn't do anything right. Apart um, from Judd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the old um, the old argument. I mean, the, 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 the accuracy for North Melbourne, it's, in, it's unbelievable. 16 set shots, every single one of them went through. What was the uh, the final score? 24 goals, 5. That, that Lindsay Thomas goal, 50 metres out, under pressure, snap on the friggin' left foot. That somehow goes through. That kind of personified the whole bloody. Now, how does he kick a goal at all, <laughs> let alone from 50 metres out on the friggin' boundary line? You know when Thomas and Hanson are drilling him. Yeah, yeah you're, you're not looking good. You can judge a leading goal scorer, for the love of God. But look, it seems like every week we talk about how bad Carlton is, so for once we could kind of talk about how good North Melbourne were. I mean, when you look at it, they. They, they they had that whole um, that poor patch of form and they were they lost by a hundred and whatever points against uh, Lance Franklin's Hawthorne with his thirteen goals and then ever since then well, I think they've won five in a row now uh, and lost by my head and lost to West Coast yeah and that lost to West Coast um, and they, they I think they're in the top eight at least tonight um, they've got a nice run on they've got a nice uh, the rest of their draw is pretty it's not that difficult. Realistically, they should make finals from here. What, what, what do we think? Like, like where, where do we rate the like? If they, even if they make finals, are they a chance to actually have an impact or what? Um, at being the only North support on the panel at the moment, I would think. Uh, this is sucking in. <laughs> uh, uh, if we've got to try against Collingwood, Collingwood's been our bogey team for the last couple of years. We've tried. We've matched it with everyone else apart from Hawthorne. So if North do sneak into the finals, they're they're going to shake you up. Yeah, well, the the close game last year between those two, I think, was eighty eight points yeah. from memory. So but Collingwood's not. Two thousand eleven Collingwood isn't two thousand twelve Collingwood. On the flip side, how bad were Carlton? Like, <laughs> I mean, and they still kicked hundred points. That's the funny thing as well. And they were in for, for in the game for half of those minutes. How like, how I don't know, I mean, what, well, what's happened to Garlett? Oh, dear God. <laughs> How that kid gets a game and can't take an uncontested mark 30 metres out in front of goal, is, it's unbelievable. Like, there's, there's, a, there's a limit. I, I understand playing a player into form, and I, I like the idea of if somebody's down and they're like, just keep on giving him games, keep on giving him a chance. But when it happens for four weeks afterwards and he's still not doing anything and he's kicked something like, the one, he kicked one goal last night, which is his only game in his, the goal in his last four-odd games or something like that, you've got to pull the pin at some stage and just say, all right, look, go back to VFL, learn to kick under pressure, learn to take an uncontested mark, for God's sake, and then come back and do what you used to do. Whack. Whack. <laughs> Smack over the face. But, um, Ash, you panel member, welcome to the team. But the, how did, um, how did you see, I guess, you also support Carlton, oh, unfortunately. You. How did you see the game? Um, well, what I noticed a lot more was that North Melbourne had, were playing more as a team, more than Carlton. Um, you had Judd there with 36 disposals, but then pretty much after that there wasn't many um, Carlton players that ha had high disposals, whereas North Melbourne had a large spread of, large, uh, of disposals rather than just one player. Um, you know, that's out that was outstanding. Obviously you got Petrie that kicked seven goals, which was fantastic. Big dish. <laughs> couldn't do seven goals. Right? They, I think that's the ultimate uh, act of smugness is to sub him off after he's kicked seven, isn't it? <laughs> We don't even care. Was it Matt Campbell who came on yeah. for him as well? That's even more of a smack in the face. No, but he had a, he had a groin injury, though. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. A groin injury. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Is this like the whole um, Fremantle versus Hawthorne thing a couple of years ago where the whole team was rested and they all had like... General soreness. General soreness. <laughs> yeah. Okay, before we head off to some sin messages, I just want to share a little bit something to... Um, it's kind of keeping me sane at the moment because being a Carlton supporter ain't a whole load of fun. So instead of going home and breaking all the windows and glass products in my house, I decided to compile a, a small list entitled The Top 11 Things That Carlton Is Worse Than. So, hitting us off at number 11, Being Lara Bingle. Being Lara Bingle is better than Carlton, currently. <laughs> number 10, drinks, it, drinks with Daniel Connors. Uh, number 9, Europe's debt crisis. They are better than us at the moment. Number 8, the carbon tax. The carbon tax is better than Carlton. Number 7, Kim Duffy's modelling career. <laughs> That's much better. Number six, Jesse Crichton's mullet. That destroys Carlton. Number five, Farron Ray's name. His name is better than us. Number four, listening to Stephen Milne try and pronounce words like thought and think. For God's sake, Stephen, they don't have F's in them. You are a 30-year-old man. Number three, Terry Wallace's list management skills. They are better than Carlton at the moment. Richard Tambling. He's better than Carlton at the moment. Number two, Scott Gumbleton's career. He's better than Carlton. Drum roll, please, for number one, a cab ride with Michael Hurley is better than Carlton. And with that, I think we're going to go shoot off to some sin messages. Sin Radio. Sin opens its doors to young people of all kinds. Hundreds of schools, youth, and community groups come to Sin each year. Our tours, workshops and programs are great for building teamwork, confidence and literacy skills. To find out about our education programs, head to sin.org.au slash education or email training at syn.org.au. What you hear on community radio is governed by the community broadcasting codes of practice. The codes of practice cover matters relating to program content that are of concern to the community, including local content, news, current affairs, Australian music content, programs for children, and the responsibilities associated with broadcasting to the community. They also cover aspects such as community access and participation in the operation of this service. Copies of the codes are available from the Community Broadcasting Association website, www.cbaa.org.au. You're back on Bound for Glory on Sin. Uh, Matt, I believe you're going to be talking about the salary cap and luxury tax. Yes, I certainly will be. Um, during the week, the AFLPA posed the possibility of scrapping the salary cap system that's currently in place and has been since 1985. In its place, the players argue that the luxury tax system is a much more viable option, which is used currently in the NBA and uh, Major League Baseball in America. Um, to vaguely outline what the luxury tax system is, teams are allowed an additional sum of money on top of the aggregate payroll of a team in exchange for a fee that becomes greater every time a team goes over the, the, the determined cap. You can keep up with that. Um, teams such as the LA Lakers in the NBA and New York Yankees in the Major League Baseball are examples of this. Uh, another system being trialled is the franchise or marquee system which allows an additional amount of the sum of the marquee player's salary to not be included in the salary cap. So, you know, for example, Chris Judd at Carlton, his, what he gets paid um, is not included in the cap, which is, I think, is probably the best idea. Um, also, players are currently arguing that the higher wages would help provide a more even competition, which we don't really understand. But, um, yeah, guys, thoughts about uh, scrapping the salary cap and, uh, yeah. Do we want to become the EPL? Yeah, that's, that was my first question as well, is do we want to be a competition where the top four teams or top five teams are always top five? or you know? It, it, it's going to end up like that if they do go with it. Um, I mean, the marquee system is a little bit better than the um, other one because at least you've got like the one player, it's a limit, that's it. I actually really like that idea as well. It's another challenge for clubs as well, for you know, clubs that, that like Collingwood, I guess, because they want to retain Swan, they want to retain Pendlebury, they want to retain Cloak, and yet they only have to choose one of those. But it also gives them the option to fit those players in, and then you have a team with a much higher overall quality. See, the luxury tax system seems, yeah, a bit of a cop-out because obviously the same teams will be up there. The ones with the better facilities will get the better players. And, I mean, so they just pretty much pay an extra amount to go over the cap. 
that would that would pretty much be the death of the teams with the, the lower membership numbers really because that's where most of the income yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, I'm staring at the Pete's just yeah, staring me just to take down the North support and the smug human being. <laughs> uh, mainly Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it sort of adds a bit of unnecessary confusion at the same time. I don't really see what's wrong with the current cap. I guess we could possibly increase the cap by you know, maybe five hundred thousand dollars because that would that would also help, and you know, player payments would be increased then as well. Especially with free agency coming in as well, you probably would have to increase the cap. Oh, good point. It's hard hitting point there, Ashley. <laughs> well, would you extend the list instead of? And then have more rookies. I, I, I think you'd, you'd keep the list the same, but um, just that extra five hundred thousand, know, that's enough to either to evenly sp you know, add ten thousand to everybody's um, ten or twenty thousand to everybody's pay slip, or you know get that one extra expensive player like Melbourne have done with um, with Clark. Yeah, that sort of thing. Like so, that that's, that seems like an alright idea to me. But at the same time, I don't really see what's wrong with the current system. Yeah, it's interesting. And the other thing, which I just thought of up then on the spot, so it's probably really stupid, um, is the fact that yeah, um, is the fact that um, in a normal job, right, if you go by a salary listing, say you've done this, you've achieved this, you get a certain pay salary, that's another option that they could have, I guess. Like, it's probably no good. But no, no. Um, yeah, no, I just thought that that way you've got a set amount, you don't have the, you know, bargaining type thing, and that way it shows you can have these certain amount of players, this kind of thing, really depends on what they've achieved, things like that. Well, what about capping the football department spending? No. <laughs> Come here. Just, just call me with support. Do you have you all the money? To go all the money? No, no, because you've got to try and get, like, teams can get more money and they, um, they try and spend in different ways too, so. But if, you, if you look at, say, Melbourne and Collingwood, Collingwood gets to go to Arizona, Melbourne, do they go to Falls, no. Falls Creek? Creek. Yeah, Falls Creek. Creek. That's St Kilda go to Preston. Yeah. How, how's that's that nice too? How's that fair? <laughs> like, if we're talking about fairness, um, well, <laughs> this is life. No, but seriously though, um, the whole point is we like every team has been poor at some stage, and they've built it up over time. Um, they've obviously had downtime, some more than others. Um, See, if we bring in this this um, the luxury tax system, it's always it's never going to have that fluctuating ladder. As well. It's always going to be the same teams yeah. that are up the top and the same teams that are down the bottom. Melbourne will never see a premiership if that happens. Yeah. Uh, is this, is, is this possibly a, uh, a bad thing? There's, there's a lot of positive in that. Well, it's been 50 years. You should be used to it. With that said, I think we're going to shoot off to some more sin messages. So my name's Josh, I run a dubstep and electro show on Monday night. You should probably listen in on uh, Mondays 8 till 10 p.m. It's fun stuff, we have regular guests, new music all the time, and we're going to be talking to the latest greatest in dubstep electro and now drum and bass. Tune in to Sins Indie Electro Night from 8 to 10. Get cereal! Slept in this week? This is what you missed. Sally! Why? Congratulations! Could you imagine it? You come home from you know a cold day today. You go, you grab your cat and you give it a good smile. We worked it out. Such a great work. Well, I, I occasionally do life modelling. But there's just a small. Hey, hey! It is not small. It is not small. Have you seen? Get cereal. Get cereal. Get cereal from 6 a.m. weekdays only on Sin. Sin Radio. You're back on Bound for Glory on Sin. Up next, we got an interview um, with Sean Edwards from GWS, and that's done by Tom Morris. I'm here with Sean Edwards, the GWS utility. Sean, thanks for joining us today on Bound for Glory. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me, Tom. Good stuff, mate. Now, I call you a utility, uh, and your athleticism and height means you can pretty, pretty much play anywhere, but where do you feel most comfortable, do you reckon? Uh, probably on the back flank. Um, you know, I've, I've played most of my junior footy on the back flank and in the midfield, so definitely coming into the... Yeah, I feel, I feel more comfortable there and uh, being able to run off. So, yeah. Talk us through last week's game versus Hawthorne. Uh, a huge loss, we all know that. But from your perspective, how did you see it? What, what sort of things did you learn from the game? Obviously, it was a tough day for the boys and the scoreline reflected that. But uh, we take little wins out of, out of each week. And obviously, Toby Green having 34 possessions against a uh, gun side is obviously a win for us. And, um, you know, we take, take positives out of that. And it's always a learning curve for the boys. And... 
we just uh, we move on now. It's it's Monday, so we're moving on for next week. So looking forward to playing the Crows this yeah. week. What about uh, individually? You played a bit on Sir Rioli as well, Jack Gunston. How do you compare the two, and what sort of things are you learning? You played on a small forward and a slightly taller one. That shows your your, uh, your range of skills as well, surely. Yeah, obviously uh, playing on Gunston, he's a bit more of a lead-up player, uh, getting the exit kicks, and playing on Cyril, he likes to race you back to the goals and uh, use his speed. So obviously week in, week out, I, I get to play on uh, different different players with different strengths, and yeah, it's all, it's always good. All right, so you're a promising young team. We all know that you've. Had a decent first up season. You've got only won one game, but you've been pretty good and competitive for at least uh, a half or a quarter of, of many games you've played. Um, but you're still rough around the edges. How tough is it to remain positive despite um, some of the re results that you've had this season? Oh, it's uh, from from the outside. It seems pretty hard to stay positive, but you know we're we're all 18, 19 year olds, and we're we're really enjoying our footy. And uh, you know we can see down the track we're we're having a a few little wins along the track, you know, the scoreboard might not reflect that, but, uh, you know, we, we, we see there's light at the end of the tunnel. So. Yeah. Which players or coaches keep you upbeat and, get in, and allow you to look forward to the next week so much? Well, obviously, our playing assistant coaches are like Chad Corns, James McDonald, Luke Power, uh, Dean Brogan, they're obviously uh, very experienced, and they know that they've been through tough times themselves and uh, shared success in premierships and uh, individual results, so, you know, they, they keep us pretty upbeat and, uh, yeah, looking forward to for the years to come. You mentioned a lot of you blokes, 18, 19 and young. How much has playing with those older blokes really helped you? I mean, you, you rarely would have played with blokes who were 33, 34 before. Has that taught you a lot about the game of footy? Yeah, obviously uh, playing with blokes like Chad Corns. He had his 250th uh, against Hawthorne on the weekend. And, uh, you know, just their passion and the way they go about their footy uh, on and off the track as well. So just the way they carry themselves is, uh, is a huge learning curve for us young fellas as well. Yeah, now let's go back to your first game against Adelaide in round four. Uh, aside from some nerves, what other emotions did you feel before that game and during that game? Oh, I was pretty uh, mixed emotions really. Like I was just, I was really happy and uh, just to get the opportunity to finally play AFL footy and uh, just to share that with my family. My family flew down from Darwin and um, yeah, I was just, I was really wrapped just to get the opportunity. Obviously, yeah, just, just happy. Yeah. Did you, did you feel a sense of pride about running out in the field that day? I mean, it's been a long time coming. Um, you've been with GWS a couple of years now. This is the first year in the competition. Did you feel as if it was going to come, or was there a few little roadblocks along the way? Oh, obviously, I've had a bit of uh, injury concerns over the last couple of years uh, with a shoulder reco and uh, a few knee problems. So, you know, I, did, I didn't think it was going to come that early, but uh, you know, I was obviously proud, of, you know, proud of myself and pretty proud to share that moment with my family. So, yeah, it was a good experience. How did Sheeds break the news to you of, uh, on your selection? Ah, uh, yeah, Sheeds rang me uh, Wednesday night. I was uh, driving home from training with Jeremy Cameron. And I was just talking about uh, how much I'd love to play, and then uh, yeah, I got a phone call, and the um, yeah, dream came true. So it was good. That's awesome stuff. Now you speak about Jeremy Cameron and Jonathan Patton. Yeah. Tell us the differences between those two. They're two pillars of your forward line and big parts of your future. You must have played on on them a couple of times at training, at least. Yeah. What have you learned from them, and how good are they, do you reckon? Oh uh, well, Jonathan Patton's uh, completely different to Jeremy. Jeremy leads up and uh, flies to the ball, whereas Patton's a lot more of a presence and. Uh, just, just Patton at 18 years old, he's, uh, he's built like a man, and uh, Jeremy's just a, a supreme athlete. So, yeah. and, and, and you live with Jeremy Cameron, or you, are you driving home with Jeremy Cameron? What sort of footy do you talk? You're living the dream, aren't you, at the moment? Yeah, living the dream, but you know, when, as, soon as, uh, as soon as the, the footy uh, training stops, uh, we, you know, we get in the car and just you know, talk a bit of crap and just have a bit of a laugh on the way home. It usually stops uh, when we leave, leave the club, so just relax a bit. Yeah. Now, individually, uh, what areas of your game have you sought to work on since you first arrived here in Blacktown? Has there been specific areas or just overall becoming a better player? Uh, probably my biggest thing to pick up on is uh, probably my defensive side. I've always uh, sort of, you know, been a, been a one-way tram, so just uh, going, going for goals. And uh, So this year it's been more defensive and just concentrating on that. So when the ball, as soon as we turn it over or it gets out of my space, just go straight to my man and wrestle my man, so that's the main thing. Yeah, where do you see where do you see your future then? Do you see your future as a sort of a running back flank or do you want to progress into the midfield and maybe forward in the future? Yeah, I'll, I uh, eventually want to get into the midfield in a couple of years as I uh, build my engine, so hopefully, you know, three, three or four years down the track with an AFL body, I can uh, go off the back flank and in the midfield, so. Yeah, now you've got, a, you've got the Crows again uh, on Sunday, this time at home. Can we expect a surprise win or at least an improved performance? And what are you working on this week to, in order to give us that performance that you need? Uh, well, obviously, uh, last time we played the Crows, we had a pretty good first half. So the, the theme for us the, uh, over the last couple of months is we're having a great first half and then dropping away. 
and that was again reflected on the weekend. So hopefully we're, we're aiming to play uh, at least three quarters and um, just go from there. Tell us about uh, some of the deflating losses so far. Just just quickly, how does Sheed react to these losses? Is he, he can never be satisfied with a loss, but surely he must have some sort of uh, realistic approach to, to each game. Oh uh, yeah, obviously going into Hawthorne there, he, he sees them as the premiers of this year. He, he tips them to uh, go all the way. So Sheeds, he's, he's pretty realistic. We have our goals, and uh, you know, obviously we want to win, but you know, we, we have our clear goals and what we what we want to work on on the weekend. So yeah. Okay, now Sean, it's time for 40 seconds with you. Sean, in one word, describe the following people: Toby Green. Ah, uh, funny. Chad Corners? Angry. Angry. James O'Donnell? Uh, exquisite. Stephen Silvani? Uh, passionate. Uh, Mark Choco Williams? Random. Buddy Franklin? Talented. Tom Scully? Running machine. Two words, Callum Ward? Good luck. Devin Smith? Quick. And Kevin Sheedy? Random again. So your two coaches are random. That's fantastic stuff, Sean. Uh, thanks for joining us today on Bound for Glory. Good luck tomorrow and for the rest of the season. Yeah, thanks, Tommy. Back on Bound for Glory on Sin. Um, text us in on 0427 767 767 on your thoughts of uh, last night's games. And um, I think Sean so sent in a couple of texts about uh, Matty's uh, rant. Do you want to read them out? Yeah, um, well, the first one uh, we got was, so why aren't Carlton anywhere near as good as the Dome as they are at the MCG? Um, I think um, Ron Connolly on, was on Twitter last night, and he, he summed it up perfectly in that uh, it's a sort of ground where you need to have a, a tall forward that can take marks because there isn't a whole lot of space, and obviously Carlton just don't have that. And he also added to the things better than Carlton least Caroline Wilson. <laughs> so, Reinformed. So, so that was pretty good. Yeah, look, I'd like to thank uh, Tom Morris again for the uh, the segment with um, superb interview. Yeah, with Sean Edwards. How many times do they do the people that he interview keep on saying two words when they're meant to say one? Just, just get out of curiosity. All right. All right. All right. So Ash, you'll be talking about uh, the the big bump from uh, last Friday's game, Carlton Collingwood, with the, the um, Jared Wellingham incident. I most definitely will. So it's been a busy week for the match review panel last week with seven um, players suspended for various offences throughout round 15. And obviously probably the most controversial one was the Sherrod Wellingham bump on Kate Simpson. So I'll assume that everyone's seen it on the panel. It's cringeworthy stuff with Wellingham providing a head high bump, leaving Simpson knocked out and concussed with a broken jaw. And throughout the week there's been a fair bit of speculation about how many weeks um, Wellingham would get for the incident, and the common number seemed to be about four weeks. Uh, in the end, he was charged with reckless conduct, um, severe impact and high contact, which is a level five offence, and usually offence of that nature would have a five-match suspension, although because of an early guilty plea and his good behaviour record, his suspension was only three matches. So there was a fair bit of debate whether the match review panel should have deemed the conduct intentional rather than reckless, as you do see Wellingham's eyes leave the ball as he jumps and issues the bump, but because the AFL believed that because he had his eye on the ball until that very last moment, it was reckless. If it had been deemed intentional, uh, the issue would have gone straight to the tribunal and they would have dealt with his penalty there. Interestingly enough, the last offence that was deemed severe um, in the AFL was the Matthew Lloyd, crunch, Matthew Lloyd bump on Brad Sewell in round 22, 2009 which was when he was when Sewell was left with a fractured cheekbone and eye socket. That was a big hit. That was a big, I watched it again. That was a massive hit. Lloyd retired after that, didn't he? He did, yeah. yeah. That was unlike Lloyd. He used to dive. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Lloyd was suspended for four weeks for that one because he didn't have a good behaviour record like Wellingham did. Um, on the topic of the uh, good behaviour record, there's been a fair bit of debate whether Wellingham should have been given a reduction as he actually debuted in 2008, which was only four years ago. Uh, the minimum for good behaviour is actually five years. But the match review panels say that he is eligible because he was elevated from the rookie list in 2007 and their philosophy is if you're eligible to play AFL, that's when your good or bad record starts. Uh, the thing that baffles me the most though about this incident is that something else that happened during the round, which was a bump on James Frawley from Matt White from Richmond. He was suspended for three matches for the head height bump. And I do believe that the bump deserved the penalty that it was given. Um, and we see the match review panel have been relatively consistent for head height bumps this season. 
but Froling wasn't injured from the bump. He played out the game. He won't be out for the next four to six weeks, at least like Simpson will be. So here comes an issue where we have to see whether the match review panel did get it right. So I'll set, put the question out there. Did the match review panel get it right? And, sorry? Uh, that's, uh, no, you've, uh, you've paid it. The last point is just perfect, is that some guy uh, has the same penalty as somebody who caused a serious injury to a player. Okay, I've got an analogy here. Alright, guys. Um, this is compared, like, is what, this is the way that they see the intentional and the reckless, right? So, it's going to be pretty bad again, so, free warning. Um, okay, so for example, you're at, like, some person's house or a party, and you, like, push someone, like, one of your friends over, you know, just mucking around. Um, would you call that intentional or reckless? Because intentional they judge as intending to harm, where reckless is you recklessly hurt them in that sense, which is what the match review panel sees it as. That's what the difference is. If I wasn't so confused, that would be a great analogy. <laughs> yeah, like in sense that, like when you say push someone over, like and it's say one of your friends or something like that, you would say it's your reckless actions, not intentionally meaning to hurt. Um, that's actually a really good point. Like, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. And I'll tell you that there's only been two uh, incidents that have been reported that have been intentional. Yes, I've done research. Um, uh, there were only two. Um, you can probably guess which ones they were. Um, there was Dean Solomon on Cameron Ling. And Barry, Hall. Barry Hall on Brent Saker. They were the only two in the whole history of since it came about five years ago. Uh, <laughs> that, that did it. And um, considering... Campbell Brown didn't even get it for his elbow to Callan Ward last year, which was, let's face it, that was intentional. Um, that's why it, it happened. Um, and the only other thing I had to say, like, I agreed that, yeah, it probably could have been more, but at the same point, the reason he got the thing for the five-year good behaviour was because technically he was on the list. Um, the only thing that they have to argue with that thing is, for example, um, a key forward or someone like Scott Gumbleton who doesn't play for about four years because he's injured, something like that, does that then start? I think that's where it, that whole idea came from. See, so, I, I think it should be your good behaviour record starts when you make your debut because otherwise you don't... You're not, you don't really have a good behaviour record because you haven't started playing yet. I mean, you might as well be judging a good behaviour record on your, your under-18s work as well, if that's the case. So, like, I'm talking particularly about, like, say, Ruckman or key forwards who may not play for three or four years. So then, do they not have theirs until they're, like, 27 or something? Uh, uh, it needs to, I think it needs to be from when you debut because that really sets in stone. Um, but then the, the, uh, the issue, the biggest issue I had with the... Um, the, the Wellingham hit, is, is the Simpsons going to be out for a minimum of four weeks, and Wellingham will be back in three. I don't understand the, the fairness around that, I don't understand how, how it, it's sort of a let off in a way, because he's got, in a way he's kind of rewarded. And, like, no, I, I agree with that. Um, the, the one thing that I do want to say about, like, not about that, but in general, is we don't want to be too stuck up about what, say, in this case, yes, but when victims get it. For example, um, if someone was to lay a really good bump and they get injured from it, or a tackle and someone slides their leg over, they're out for, say, the season. You don't want to have the rule where they've got to sit out the whole time. So that's the only thing. That's why it's a bit grey in it's that area. similar to that, uh, the Lindsay Thomas, Gary Rowan. Rowan's out for the year. Yeah. And Thomas, he got two weeks, but then he appealed it. He yeah. Got, no so, worries. like, in that situation, does Thomas then sit out the rest of the season? That's the only, the grey area there. Like, you can understand it, but... <laughs> yeah, I think we should chuck to some sin messages, and after that we'll be talking about the potential Rising Star candidates. Here's what you missed on In Joke this week. I've been punched in the stomach once, and that was two of my friends with grinding lemon wedges into each other's eyes. Oh. Because oh, that's what my friends do. I could do lemons. <laughs> yeah, just, just really grind them in there. Listen to In Joke from 5pm Sundays on Sin. Ah, oh, Timmy, I'm home. It's been a bugger of a day again. Oh, really, Jules? Tell me about it. Let me, let me cut your hair. No, Tim, bless you. Cutting my hair is always your solution. If it's okay with you, I'm going to go into the lounge and listen to my favourite current affairs show, Panorama. 4 to 5pm weekdays on Sin. Bring the cathedral, Tim. Sin Radio. Back on Bound for Glory on Sin, um, one of our uh, panel members, Eve, he's raised, a, raised an interesting point on the, the last topic. Yeah. Um, 
it's I think he he stayed he, he stayed he stated that uh, it should be based on how many games that you play rather than how many seasons you've been in the system. I think that's that's no, that's, that's, that's actually probably the best. I, I reckon about fifty mm. games would be good considering you don't usually play your you, the fifty games that your team plays while you're on the list. You don't always play those whole games, so that might be spread across three, four, five years. Yep. No, that that's probably the best suggestion. Right now, speaking of fifty gamers, people who are going to have less than fifty. Ooh. Yeah. Segway. Segway. Worst. That was the worst. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, rising, rising star candidates. Uh, this year, it seems to be a pretty. I wouldn't say even races. Like maybe four or five people who have led from the front, and then other people who have kind of, you know, been a bit of smokies. Uh, obviously, the biggest one, Jeremy Cameron from GWS. Uh, interestingly, he escaped charge from his tribunal case this week on his strike on Clinton Young. So he's still eligible for the Rising Star, and uh, at this stage he's looking to be the goods. He's kicked 22 goals in 12 games. Uh, Daniel Talia from the Crows, really promising key back, uh, taking a bit of time to develop. Um, I would say he's probably Cameron's biggest rival, um, and many Crows fans singing his praises. Uh, another GWS player, Toby Green, uh, absolute ball magnet, who's produced uh, consistent results, which is... I think the most crucial part of voting. We saw Heppel win last year with a string of 20 plus possession games. Um, I think this votes well with Green. Um, yeah, so looking at people from further back in the field, Mitch Wallace, he's firmed up into second favourite for the betting, although I think he's tapered off a little bit in the past you know, month or so. Uh, Steve Motlop, um, easily the most exciting candidate for me. Um, shown more than flashes of brilliance, which, you know, could be. Could be a good thing for him, but I don't think he'll win it. Um, Dolby, uh, Jake Carlisle, Dylan Scheel, uh, Steve Coniglio, Tom McDonald also look the goods, but yeah. quite far back. Um, and I think the most unfortunate person this year is Dylan Grimes. Um, in the first five or so rounds, he dominated with Rance in the back line, and I would have thought that he would have been like absolute shoe in to win it if he didn't get injured. Now, the point I want to raise, guys, um, look, obviously, Rising Star is generally a good predictor of talent. But I personally couldn't give a stuff about Hebel winning the award last year. Do, do fans really, you know, do we really care about the Rising Star? Not really, to be honest. And that's also, at the same time, is that's also I really why I really hope that um, one of the key position guys, either Jeremy Cameron or Daniel Talia, wins it. Because we've, the same year, it's usually the same thing. It's a young midfield, midfielder or a halfback or something, one of those real... Um, big possession getting players. It'd be really good to, to freshen it up and have somebody who plays in a key position role win it. And um, it should probably be noted that Toby Green can't win it because he's been suspended. <sighs> Just thought I'd mention I? that. <laughs> um, but usually it does actually come from a lower team, the Rising Star winner, um, because obviously the um, higher teams don't get to play as many debutants, or if they do, they don't um, have as much of an impact compared to those in weaker teams. Um, so GWS will have a heap of those up for offer, um, along with the other teams there. Um, I'm surprised there's no Gold Coast players. Mm. Well, you yeah, look I at think the we're pretty you probably understand, understand why. Gold Coast have taken a, a, either not a step back, but haven't taken a step forward mm -hmm. so far. Yeah, well, um, if Gary Ablett could win it, he probably would. Can, <laughs> um, can Josh Caddy win it? Oh, Josh Caddy? Um, I assume so. Yeah. If he's still playing at Gold Coast yeah. at the end of the year. I don't think he played enough games Ooh, last year. Scoop, is scoop? <laughs> no. <laughs> Big footy scoop. Uh, the Caddy to Essendon thing. Well, that's been going on for years. Like, for years? Before he even started. <laughs> Before he was born. That's like David Swallow coming to North. No, it's not going to happen. Jeremy Cameron coming to Carlton. Scoop. <laughs> Just say a million different scoops. And then All right, yeah, Joey. I think you got. Um, you're going to talk about video technology. Now. Yes, video technology. Ooh. So I presume all of you watched the Melbourne Richmond game last week. It was a surprise to. It was a surprise. It was a surprise to many that AFL brought in video technology for goal line reviews so quickly this season without any significant testing, and it seems to not have worked. On two occasions on the Richmond game last week, two wrong decisions were given. How can, a how can, in a world of technology, we can get two wrong decisions? It baffles me. The first one was the Magna Shank. Biggest shank in the world, but still went through. The goal umpire thought it was a goal. Uh, it was about to signal a goal. The boundary umpire, who's then a boundary umpire, not goal umpire, came in and said, oh, I thought it was touched. So they review it. They know conclusive... Conclusive? Yeah, conclusive. 
uh, evidence was shown, and I gave the lesser score a point. So what's the point of having technology if you can't overrule it? And then we have the second one where Matt White snaps a goal, goes through, the Richmond Cheer squad starts celebrating, goal umpire signals a point, all the Richmond players signal for the third umpire, umpire doesn't care, and a point's given. So we've got technology, why don't we use it? Why, and, and where do we go from here? Uh, the way I think, I really think it, that it should run, as in, as you mentioned last week with the Melbourne Richmond game, how there was the uh, the goal that that was a goal, and then the boundary umpire decided, oh, it might have been touched, and because he said that it might have been touched, it's ruled inconclusive. It should be the goal umpire needs to say, I think it's a goal, or I think it's a point. Last week he thought it was a goal, and then they went to the review. Rather than it being inconclusive and giving the lesser score, it needs to be go back to what the goal umpire thought. In that case, the goal umpire thought it was a goal, it needs to be marked as a goal. If we didn't have the uh, the goal line technology or the review system, then last year it would have been marked as a goal because that's what the umpire thought it was. Yeah, it should just go back to the goal umpire's decision. It's like um, with most sports, if they're not sure, you go back to the original decision. So is, is anybody else really, I guess, uh, pissed off the fact that they have a, a review system and they go to the review system to this, like for something real small such as an out on the full and they get it wrong. Uh, the thing is, if, if, like with the Carlton Hawthorne I mean, yeah. the other week, I think it was Suckling that's... Um, that he stepped on the ball, it bounced, and then it went over the line. It, the slow motion replay clearly shows that, and yet they called it out on the full. I don't understand. You have the, the replay continuously. Why can't you get the right decision? I think with the replay, it can only be used on goal line decisions. It can't be used on uh, out of bounds. Well, they, they do it when it's behind or out on bounds. They yeah, can do that. You yeah, can't oh. do it like on the wing or like. Um, no, they, they actually they did review that. They, they yeah. this out on the full. They reviewed it and then they chose that it was out on they, the full. They've when done it's that clearly. Um, it was clearly in bounds. The funny thing is when they're like a team's like twelve or thirteen goals down and they decide to review one between a behind and an out and a full. You are kind of like really. But so. where do we go from here? They're like. I presume video technology was brought in so we don't see a Tommy Hawkins a la 09 grand final who hits the post. See, that, but that's what it needs to be used for, and just that. It doesn't need to be used for these small little things you know, on half forward flank while a team's down by 60 points. It doesn't need to be used then. If somebody has a shot at the goal and it might have hit the post but they're not sure, sure, review then. That's when it needs to be used. But other than that, I really don't see a need for it. Well, ob obviously, if they're going to use it, they either have to have more cameras or more goal umpires. Like, if they have more goal umpires, more eyes, hopefully one of them, between both of them, they can have two pairs of eyes. Um, <laughs> I just do it then. Squish! I just put it in the wall. Just quickly, do you reckon we should maybe give the captain one opportunity The Colonial Ambassador would like to add that you should listen to the Sci-Fi Hiker's Guide to the Galaxy, available on SIN 9.7 from 3pm until 4. That, or... Okay, I'll be completely honest, I have no idea what this guy's saying. Oh, so my name's Josh, I run a dubstep and electro show on Monday night. You should probably listen in. Mondays, 8 till 10 p.m. It's fun stuff. We have regular guests, new music all the time, and we're going to be talking to the latest, greatest in dubstep, electro, and now drum and bass. Tune in to Sims in the Electro Night from 8 to 10. 
did you know that Paul McCartney from the Beavers actually died in 1966 and was replaced by the Paul McCartney lookalike with surgical adjustments done to his face? No way. Yes way. The proof of this is placed in many of the Beatles' other albums. You can see on the front of Rubber Soul that they're looking down into Paul's grave. Or on the cover of Magic Mystery Tour when Paul is the only one dressed in black. Also, on the great track number 9, if you play it backwards very slow, you can hear them say, Paul is dead. Paul is dead. That sounds like some very well substantiated evidence. I believe so. Sadly though, George Harrison was unable to do an interview with us. If you want more awesome conspiracy theories, listen to The Conspiracy Campfire. 1pm Saturdays on Sin. You're back on Bound for Glory on Sin. Uh, just quickly, um, I think we should talk about Chris Judd's chicken wing and also um, Jack Siebel's bump last night. It humors me that Carlton supporters are trying to defend it. He wasn't trying to do anything else other than hurt him. Yep. That's, that's pretty obvious. All you need to do is watch the video once. And he wasn't trying to get the boy. He's just trying to bend his arm. Did you say that would be intentional, mate? Yeah. <laughs> well, our third intentional. <laughs> you are, he'll probably only get one or two weeks for it because of his, his status in the competition. I wouldn't be shocked. He's got a bad record. Doesn't matter. Bloody match review panel, mate. Doesn't matter. It does actually tend to be when, like, either a player's on the ground or something like that, where it's been... Because there was, what, the Richard Talley one and the Pavlich one as well, wasn't there? So... And then we, we had the Zebel one, a massive bump on the wing on Aaron Joseph. Did he get weeks? I don't think so. He hit him in the shoulder, so... Yeah, I, I thought beforehand it would get weeks, but um, upon actually seeing the replay, he didn't make contact with his head. It's, I think the fact that he left the ground, um, that makes it look like it could be really dangerous. It was just a hard bump. Had he not left the ground, it would have just been credited with a, a hard bump. And with that, we're going to shoot off to the previews. First game of the day, Melbourne versus Fremantle at Eddie Had Stadium. Sell out, sell out. <laughs> Absolute blockbuster. <laughs> but yeah, um, it's, it's a week that's um, a, a week of potential upsets if you have a look at all the previews. This is st the one to start us off. Are Melbourne a, a legitimate chance without Clark? No, no. It's in Melbourne, mm. so that's the only chance. Comes down to how Ross Lyon plays, I think. Frio hasn't been Melbourne the last three times. So. Melbourne. There's a stat. And Eddie had, and, sorry, and Melbourne have won the two times they've played Fremantle at Eddie had as well. Stats from Western. <laughs> me in for Melbourne and, women. And Melbourne hasn't won at Eddie Had since 2008. <laughs> <laughs> and so they obviously haven't Melbourne. played them in a while there. Pavlich on Frawley is going to be a, um, a very tasty matchup, I think. Um, delicious. Is in, it's delicious. It's going to be, he's in, Pavlich is in great form at the moment. It'll take a pretty big effort to stop him because all of a sudden Pavlich has, has flicked the switch. Rosslyn decides, hey, we have a key forward. Let's play him as a key forward. And they're kicking goals and they're kicking winning scores. Melbourne's forward line looks like a defence. Yeah. River, Rivers, Rivers, no forward line. <laughs> Rivers, uh, Garland. Garland. You got green there. Green. Yeah, this is easier rock. <laughs> <laughs> but so yeah, uh, tips. Who are we going for? I reckon D's this week. Ooh. I'll tip Melbourne. No, I'm sticking. With yeah, Melbourne. I'm sticking with Frio. They've they've been okay in Melbourne this year so far. They knocked off Richmond and Melbourne's last month hasn't been too bad. They beat GWS. They well, weren't they weren't too really? bad against. Collingwood. They knocked off Essendon. I'm going Fremantle. Yeah, yeah, yeah Fremantle. Freo. Freo. Uh, Port Adelaide versus Essendon, also known as the return of Gumbleton. <laughs> Might play a quarter or two depending on how long he stays. Lasts. Yeah. The bench warmer. How is this getting any press coverage? I don't understand. <laughs> he's not even that good. He's, 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 oh, get, ooh, he's, uh, no, he's, he's getting a game because he is the bottom of the barrel, literally, because yeah. they have nobody else. In hindsight, Looking back, though, Lachlan Hansen was picked three in that draft. I mean, he dominated last night. <laughs> so, are you, are you calling a, uh, a potential a potential Gumbleton bag today? I am. Against Port Adelaide, could be possible. If no, no, forget. Uh, yeah, if, if he kicks more than three goals, I'll I'll buy you a convertible. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got that down? No. Ten no, nine. I wonder if any of the Essendon players are listening to that then. <laughs> Start organising. Maybe even the port players. <laughs> they're miles up. To Gumby. If we start seeing cheapies to Gumby in the goal square, I'm going to start crying. <laughs> Maybe we need a clause in that contract. <laughs> Tips. I, I'm, I'm, I originally had Essendon, but I've, I've swapped to Port Adelaide because Essendon have a terrible record over there. Yeah, I'm also going Port because I just don't think... Uh, both sides are heavily affected with injuries, but I don't think we can play well at Amy. I think Essendon, Gumble. 
think you can Essendon for redemption. I, I reckon Essendon will win because even though they've got injuries, uh, lots of injuries, Port have even more. Richmond Gold Coast, had this game been in Melbourne, you'd think it would be an absolute walkover, but it's up at Kazali Stadium. I believe that this is the fixture that Richmond lost last week, last year. Yeah, so so you don't want to rule out Gold, uh, Gold Coast at all. And Richmond have lost Nathan Foley for the season. That's a huge loss. You'd think they'd still have the depth to cover it against Gold Coast. So they've been in terrible form. The, uh, the Suns. Or Gary Ablett. Well, not Gary Ablett, he is the team. Both these sides are you know, vastly different to how they were performing last year, so I think, for me, Richmond should easily win this. If they, if they have another inaccurate performance like they did last week against Melbourne, is there a chance that Gold Coast could get a win? It wouldn't surprise me. If they perform like they did against Geelong, who pushed them, um, you never know. But I don't think so. I don't think Richmond... I reckon Richmond will be aware... This, last this is the typical game Richmond do lose. Though. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's yeah. not good when they travel to these sort of these sort of stadiums that aren't really. They're not good hand. against crap teams. Yeah, yeah that's, so that's true. That's pretty much what it is. All right, so tips. Richmond. Yeah, yeah Richmond, but Richmond, not by much. Yeah. I don't think I'm not too certain about this one. Yeah, I'm going Richmond as well. Geelong, Collingwood, finally a game that is really stands off uh, out of the paper. Geelong are, are desperate to get a win. They could also make top four still. That's a, a real possibility. Yeah. I just, I don't know, I can't see it happening, because they've got a tough run, but, you know, uh, having said that, I think this, uh, besides the West Coast Sydney match, will be obviously the biggest, biggest drawing match this, this round, um, some tasty matchups, I reckon. Yeah, yeah I like it, I reckon it's going to become the thing tasty. <laughs> tasty. <laughs> well, I, I, personally, I'm just sick of playing teams that have, need a win, we want to play someone who doesn't need a win, <laughs> that way they won't try as hard, like, I think... But, Bartel is a huge loss. Yeah, yeah. without Bartel, but, I would have thought it would be a real close contest because when he plays Collingwood, he switches it on. But uh, it's no, usually, I, I think Collingwood will be really hungry for it. It's usually a Pendlebury versus Bartel contest in this in the usual um, games, and Pendlebury had 33 and four goals last night. Will Pendle play a full game though? He'd better. <laughs> <laughs> he says with a grimace. Uh, no, uh, I'm, I'm sticking with Collingwood because they had a, a bad loss last week. Uh, they won't want to lose anymore because they, they, they have a serious chance to go uh, redeem themselves from last year as well. They've already beaten them once this year, they'll want to do it again. And they got Hawthorne without Franklin next week and then GWS finally. So, <laughs> they're waiting for it. How much percentage do you want? <laughs> yeah, well, we don't get uh, Gold Coast, GWS and Port twice. So. Fair point. Kips? Mm. Yeah, pies. Yeah, I'm going pies and hoping that Scott Pendlebury gets up because last round, last time he played Geelong, he kicked four goals and had 30 possessions. Stats. Left yeah, and that's right. Okay. That's okay. Someone that's actually <laughs> asked something to this Yeah, I said that about 10 seconds. <laughs> 20 seconds ago, that's all right. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> all right, uh, Lions and uh, Saints up at the Gabba. Um, potentially an interesting game. Um, yeah, I, I, I had um, Brisbane initially because they played the Gabba sensationally mm -hmm. and um, they had that win against West Coast up there not too long ago. But they're also missing a lot of their, their small for, their small backmen, Brisbane. Um, with the amount of small forwards and quality small forwards that Saints have, I think they'll be the key to winning and they'll win relatively comfortably. Is Hanley playing this week? Is he in or is... Yeah, you mentioned me on the spot, please. Well, <laughs> because he's been in absolutely he, ripping form. He so, is. Yeah. He's playing on the wing yeah. and he's playing on Dalsano and he'll dominate. I think so. I reckon I've got an inkling that you know he's going to get another 25 plus, you know, couple of goal game up against the Saints because they're just not quick enough for him. But will that be enough to get them a win? I think so. I'm going wise this week. Yeah. If Lions do win, do I get a car? <laughs> just <laughs> just, just stock them up. You can, you can give back my Gumbleton car. <laughs> Gumbleton would be. Enough. Maybe you could have got him a convertible that works as well as Scott Gumbleton. <laughs> <laughs> so it breaks down every. Yeah, I got a couple hundred couple bucks. Levels. I go back. And go. You know. Get some used mobile of some sort. Um, yeah, Ash. Yeah, I'm going St Kilda. Yep, I'm also going Saints. GWS Adelaide. For God's sake, do we bother? No. <laughs> Just straight up with tips. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a, another case of how many. Uh, GWS were a massive letdown last week. They were going all right. There was a, a four-week patch where they were doing really well, but they've just sort of gone away oh, for not too long. They've also rested a lot of plays this week, yeah. so... Yeah. Will they win another game for the season? They... probably not. I think Gold Coast will beat them when they... they uh, They're running out of legs. It's the time to burst them. 
So they had a win. That's <laughs> long enough. <laughs> Yeah, so Adelaide by a fair bit. Although Adelaide said they're not going to chase percentage, but as if you wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> like, seriously. <laughs> like, seriously. Especially yeah. in this season. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Bulldogs Hawthorne. At Eddie had it. If it were at the MCG, I'd pretty much have this done. Yeah. But Bulldogs still don't have a forward line, or at least a forward line that can actually kick over yeah. 80 points. Like, you have to go for Hawthorne, not because they're, like, they're missing Franklin and things like that, but... They're the Bulldogs. You've got to keep so, in mind, Roughhead is an extremely damaging forward. I think he kicked six last week as well. The Hawthorne variety. Yes. yes. Well, I was like, hang on a second. What? No, right. The Hawthorne one. Oh, oh, no. oh yeah. Just <laughs> click. No, the other guy is... Um, the other guy is brother. Yeah, no. He can go hold hands with uh, with Gumbleton in the reserves soon enough. <laughs> Gumbleton's going to just gonna zinger past me. Gumbleton's <laughs> going to kick tons of goals. <laughs> <laughs> no, all the goals. Uh, tips. <laughs> Hawthorne for me. Yeah, Hawthorne. Yeah. 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 What the the game of the round? It's been one of the games I've been looking forward to for a while. West Coast Sydney uh, over at Patterson Stadium. It'd be nice if it were, you know, if it wasn't that complete dominance of, of supporters, so that we could really see where these teams are at. But have it in Adelaide. Yeah, just yeah, just play at Kazali Stadium. Actually, no, no one to chop it. Much. <laughs> yeah, they only had two grand finals that got over 90,000. That's it. Just set it up on Ayers Rock and play a match. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Uh, uh, West, over there, I don't think West Coast can be beaten. They're just too good. They're just far too good. And like, at the same time, Sydney aren't great away from Sydney. And, and I mean, West Coast get to have the extra three players on their side over there. Yeah. So. <laughs> what um, yeah. So. Yes. Ash is Luke, farm um, umpire. Would she know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's on the stat. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. He's due for an umpiring, I'm sure. Yeah. Just remember we had that second. Yeah, there was, there was yeah. a yeah. He's had a Luke Farmer, like, yeah. so he kept up to date with it, but um, his umpiring can basically already give it to West Coast. Although they should win, you'd think they'd win over there, relatively comfortably. Yeah. I reckon it should be still a fairly close game, but yeah, West Coast for me. West Coast for me as well. West Coast easily. Yeah. Alright, so perhaps we should get into the plugs. Sergeant Supercoach on Twitter. Um, Bound for Glory News, Matty. Yes, know. the Bound for Glory News. It's finally up and going tonight. It's going to be launched Sunday, 12 a.m., as in coming up later today. So don't go to bed early. So get excited for that while you're watching the football. It's going to be a great initiative. Um, Ash, you're the editor of the site as well. You're looking forward to it. We're all looking forward to it. It's something that we've always that we've we wanted to. We sort of dabbled in when we started the show. So we wanted to have this extension and have this, this new service so that we can sort of basically get our opinions out there in, in print and in text rather than just on the radio show. Uh, it's finally coming to fruition. Excited. Uh, what's the slogan? We... Uh, it's a bad that I can't think of at the moment. <laughs> we keep... No, we keep... Mass media honest. Keeping the mass media honest, that's exactly right. They yeah. break it, we fix it. <laughs> 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 and next week, I uh, might want to add that we've got a couple of interviews. Um, Jake Stringer and Oliver Wines, so both from Bendigo Pioneers, who are really helpful. So, um, yeah, and lastly, obviously, just follow us on uh, Twitter and Facebook at um, hashtag Bound for Glory and um, Facebook uh, forward slash, what is it? Bound for Glory FM? Yes, yeah, that's yeah, it. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Wrap right. up another show. Thank you very much. Racking up the milestones. Like there's, there's 17 in Milestone, or 18, or whatever we're on. Well, 18 would be, I guess. Just before we leave, I'll have to clear my garage, because I'm getting convertible. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep, Gumbledon kicks three, he gets a... I get a convertible as well if he doesn't kick three. Keep oh, that in mind. We did, we did have no, 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 no. I haven't signed no contract. <laughs> All right. Verbal contract. <laughs> on the record. Okay, before this completely goes to mess, that was a good show, and we're going <laughs> to... I'm invincible. I'm paying money. Uh, the girl's happy. She's got no money. I got my rocks off. Oh, how good is this?
stuck in this week? This is what you missed. Sally! Why? Congratulations. Could you imagine it? You come home from you know a cold day today, you go, you grab your cat and you give it a good schmarl. We worked in yeah. such a great work. I, I occasionally do life modeling. But there's just a small... Hey, hey, it is not small. It is not small. Have you seen? Get cereal. Get cereal. Get cereal from 6am weekdays only on Sim. Looking for a fun excursion? Sim offers exciting radio tours for schools, community groups and more. Learn about community radio and get hands-on producing your own podcast show in the Sim studios. Are you a student? Tell your teacher about Sim. If you're a teacher, go to syn.org.au forward slash education or email training at syn.org.au. That's syn.org.au slash education or email training at syn.org.au. The Klingonian ambassador would like you to know that he has a live cat in his pants. And he enjoys it. Program Wab Jab B is A Villa Dach 90.7 Dach Chefli. The Klingonian ambassador would like to add that you should listen to the Sci Fi Hacker's Guide to the Galaxy, available on Sin 90.7 from 3 pm until 4. That or. Okay, I'll be completely honest, I have no idea what this guy's saying. <laughs>